So uh, thanks everyone for joining uh, the Glaze webinar today. The Glaze Consortium webinar is a series uh, of live recorded presentations that cover a broad range of topics related to the controlled environment agriculture. These webinars feature the latest technological innovations and best practices in the CEA field, providing the audience the opportunity to connect and discover new solutions presented by field experts. Uh, just before we start our presentation today with Dr. Ranko, I would like to thank our Glaze industry members for their support. Uh, thanks to them, we can promote these types of activities. So a huge thanks uh, to all the Glaze industry members and CEA members. Also, I'd like to make a quick announcement. We are super excited uh, to bring to you the 2021 Virtual Plant Lighting Short Course. Uh, this is being brought by Glaze by Optimia and Project LAMP. Uh, so it, it's a joint effort in which Dr. Ranko happens to be uh, the director of one of those, Optimia. Uh, also, Professor Mark Van Irso at University of Georgia with Project LAMP. And then Dr. New Madison and Elsbeth Comos from Cornell and RPI with Glaze. So super excited. If you're interested in this talk today from Dr. Ranko, you're likely to be interested in this, in this plant lighting short course. Uh, it will be a series of six module presentations. Uh, over 12 hours of content, everything can be accessed on demand. So if you cannot make one of these presentations, you can get the, the content later. And you can also apply for continue education unit credits from Certified Crop Advisor. So great opportunity for those of you who want to get some extra credits as well. With that said, uh, let's jump for the presentation today. Uh, so Dr. Ranko, thanks for being here today with us. Uh, great to have you presenting on the Glaze webinar series again. <laughs> I think you're regular on our presentations every year here. The audience asks for it, so we keep asking you to come back. Uh, so Dr. Ranko is on the faculty in the Department of Horticulture at Michigan State University. His research focuses on the environmental physiology of herbaceous specialty plants grown in greenhouses and indoor farms. He is the project director of Optimia, optimizing indoor agriculture for leafy green production. For this project, he is investigating how environmental factors, uh, especially lighting and temperature manipulations, influence growth and development of annual bedding plants, herbaceous perennials, leafy greens, and potted flowering plants. The underlying objective of his research is to improve the efficiency and quality of high value specialty crops production. Uh, I would like to let you know that uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available at glaze.org, uh, maybe two, three days after this presentation. Uh, so if you want to access that later on, you can come to the website uh, and, and get the presentation. And I'll encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen today to submit questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that said, Dr. Ranko, thank you so much for being our presenter today. And I will stop sharing my screen and give you the word. Okay. Well, thank you, Erico. Um, appreciate the invitation and uh, appreciate everyone joining me. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about a lot of the research that my group has been doing the last uh, three years or so in indoor production of leafy greens. And toward the end, I'll be sharing some research from my colleague, Roberto Lopez and his student um, at Michigan State that they are part of uh, this project that I'll be talking about here in a minute. So yeah, first and foremost, I do wanna acknowledge Nathan Kelly. He's a current PhD student with me and uh, Ching Wu Meng, who is a former PhD student and is now an assistant professor at the University of Delaware. This project is largely funded through a specialty crop research initiative grant through the USDA uh, NEFA program but we also have many other collaborators uh, and supporting agencies that are part of this project and we certainly appreciate their uh, in-kind donations and uh, contributions to make this financially possible. So as I uh, mentioned briefly, uh, we have a um, specialty crop research initiative project that is focused on producing leafy greens indoors and we're talking indoors specifically referring to vertical farms. So there's no sunlight. The light that plants receive is from usually now from LEDs. 
And our foci focus is uh, looking at both the economics, but also co-optimization of environmental parameters, considering uh, optimizing yield, as well as uh, many of the different quality attributes that exist. So a lot of the work we do is focused on lighting, and that's a big part of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, but also interactions with other parameters. This is a project that is led at Michigan State, but we have uh, very important uh, uh, PIs from Ohio State, uh, Cherry Kubota, uh, Kerry Mitchell at University, uh, excuse me, at Purdue University, and Marat Casera at University of Arizona, joined with uh, Roberto Lopez at Michigan State and uh, Simone Valle de Souza, who is an economist here at Michigan State. Uh, we also have some other collaborators and industry partners um, that are also important to this project. So um, this is a, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the primary objectives of this research. I want to then talk about an experiment that investigated delivering different photosynthetic photon flux densities. We call that PPFD and how that's delivered during the day for another number of hours per day to um, yield different daily light integrals. Then I'll talk about a couple of experiments that investigated the roles of blue, green, and far red light and influencing both yield and some of the quality attributes. And then I'll give some preliminary results from an end of production lighting study uh, that was performed fairly recently and then conclude with um, some of the work also preliminary results with effects of temperature and carbon dioxide enrichment, uh, sometimes in combination with different light intensities. Uh, so a little bit of background for those of you who may be not too familiar with light, we can simplistically think of it as being in three dimensions. First is the intensity or the quantity of light. This is often described as the photosynthetic photon flux density either per, per second or sometimes it's an accumulated value per day. Then we have light quality, which is the photon spectrum, the color of the light, and then the duration of the light delivered per day, which we describe as the photo period. The intensity of light has a primary effect, major impact on photosynthesis, which then leads to biomass. So how, my, how, how much does the uh, plant way when it's harvested, for example, is an indicator of biomass. The light quality or the spectrum has a pronounced effect on the shape or the architecture of a plant, so it can influence things like leaf expansion and stem extension. And for at least some specialty crops, and especially ornamentals, the way that light is delivered per day, uh, and particularly the number of hours of light at night, can influence whether a plant flowers or not, or in some cases, it can uh, regulate just the timing of flowering. Of course, it's not quite this simple, and a lot of our research and that of my colleagues is to investigate these interactions. And it's a sort of thing where the more we learn about these interactions, uh, more questions then arise. And so these different parameters or properties of light interact not only to influence the yield of crops of leafy but also many of the quality attributes. So indoor farming is not new. Uh, it is rapidly emerging in the United States, especially in the last five years, but it's existed in uh, Asia and particularly in Japan since the 1980s. And before we had LEDs that were commercially available, um, plants were usually uh, provided with light uh, from fluorescent lamps or in some cases, hyper sodiums like we see in this fixture. So it's a fairly mature industry in Japan, and yet it is still uh, rapidly emerging in the US as well as many other parts of the world. What's really new and exciting though, and I think um, makes this sector of agriculture much more viable is the advancements in uh, LED technology, uh, both in terms of the efficiencies, which we refer to as the efficacy of the fixtures, basically conversion of electricity into light that is useful for plants, as well as the costs of those fixtures have come down remarkably. So the costs are going down, the outputs of the light have uh, dramatically increased, as well as the electrical efficiencies of the fixtures. 
And so uh, we have the Controlled Environment Lighting Laboratory, which acronym is CELL, at Michigan State University. Uh, it's been in operation now over three years, and we are using it to do a lot of research, uh, in some cases with ornamental seedlings, but uh, especially with leafy greens, such as with lettuce. The general objectives of our research with leafy greens, and especially in my program, is to consistently and rapidly produce leafy greens considering energy consumption, as well as different attributes of of course, yield and particularly the fresh mass is quite important. Uh, we also know that these parameters, uh, the lighting parameters can be influencing the leaf size, the shape, the color and, of the leaf and the texture. And some of those can be considered some of the quality uh, traits of plants, as well as the nutritional content. Um, there may be differences in how people respond to lettuces grown under different environments and how it might influence the taste and the mouthfeel, as well as potentially the environment influencing the shelf life of the crop after it's harvested. So I'm gonna be talking about some of these uh, different attributes uh, today uh, with more research here planned down the road. So very briefly, um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the daily light integral and that is the product of light intensity uh, and the photo period. And it's basically the total accumulated light of uh, from 400 to 700 nanometers uh, delivered per square meter in one day. And the unit is moles per square meter per day. And in this first experiment, our objectives were first to generate more data about how daily light integral, uh, which is the acronym we use for the uh, DLI is the acronym we use for daylight integral, how that affects growth and quality of lettuce, and then to determine whether growth is similar of lettuce when the DLI is the same, but the intensity and the photo period to achieve that are different. Um, so we grew these lettuces at 72 degrees Fahrenheit constant um, at ambient CO2, so we were not enriching with CO2. And plants were grown under 12 different lighting treatments. They had photo periods of either 16, 20, or 24 hours. Photosynthetic photon flux densities ranging from 120 to 270 micromoles per square meter per second. And then the product of those two yielded DLIs that range from about seven to 15 and a half moles per day. The light environment in terms of the spectrum was the same in all treatments, and it consisted of 50% warm white and 50% red LEDs. So it's a spectrum that includes a lot of red light. And we harvested plants uh, basically when the canopy was pretty full, which was 27 or 28 days after seed cell. Here is a graph of the results and we're presenting uh, most of it here in relation to the daily light integral. So that's uh, on the bottom or the X axis and then in this case, we're showing the leaf width of the two varieties that we studied, Rex on the left and Rouchy, as the, I, I think as the French say it, that's on the right. And so if you, uh, you can see the data are plotted. On the right, we have the different PPFD and photo period combinations. And what we found is that there were pretty clear linear trends with respect to how daily light integral influenced leaf width. So leaf width typically increased for both varieties, and it was especially uh, noticeable in the cultivar Rouchy. Looking at leaf number, typically as the plants were grown under higher light, um, you can see that the leaf number increased in a linear fashion, and especially with Rouchy, uh, where you increase the daylight integral, um, you could see that there were two, three, or four more leaves per plant which is pretty remarkable considering that these uh, lettuces were not grown for very long. So we have slightly wider leaves and we have uh, an increase in leaf number. Therefore, we would pr probably predict that we're gonna have more biomass. Um, for one reason is that the plants could intercept more light, which could then uh, lead to greater growth. And indeed, we did see an increase in fresh mass, uh, pretty consistent effect on both cultivars. Regardless of how the light was delivered, we see this increase. 
But I do want to point out um, some differences that emerged under the highest daily light integral, the integral of about 15 and a half moles per day. And so if you look at the, uh, I colored some of the symbols where we have um, basically the uh, different extremes of that, um, of the parameters to obtain the DLI of 15 and a half moles. So when we had relatively low light of 180 micromoles delivered continuously, so 24 hours per day, um, actually the biomass of both cultivars were, were higher uh, as indicated by the uh, yellow triangles compared with when we had the same daily light integral, but it was delivered only 16 hours per day, but at, but at about 50% higher intensity of 270 micromoles. And so we saw this consistently, um, which basically led us to believe that when you have a choice of um, delivering a, a relatively high light integral, that there was greater growth when the light was delivered for a long period at a lower intensity compared to vice versa. So that's data for fresh mass. And then not surprisingly, we saw similar trends for the dry mass. Um, here are some photos that uh, show representative plants of each treatment. And just a, a word of caution, my, my students take these photos and they're fantastic. Um, they try to select the most representative plant in the treatment and they do their best. And usually the photo is truly representative, but the reason we collect the data is that, um, you know, we're not uh, biasing ourselves and we have um, actually numbers to go by. And so um, I think the, the photos are very informative but ultimately, I think what's most important is what the data show. And so um, here are representative plants of the Rex and the Rushi under these different uh, highlight uh, environments, all at 15 and a half moles per day. And you can see the data showing the fresh mass is greater under the longest photo period at the lower intensities. Okay, I wanna shift gears a little bit into uh, how lighting and especially blue light uh, with or without green or far red light can influence the morphology and the yield of, of leafy greens. And so this is a, um, a pretty interesting study uh, with quite a few treatments to begin to better understand how these different colors of light regulate um, different quality parameters as well as yield. So briefly here are the treatments. Um, we started with what we would consider maybe a control treatment with a high intensity of blue. So B60 would mean 60 micromoles of blue light and R120 is then 120 micromoles of red light. So that was the base photo period. And then from there, um, we had three treatments that partially or completely reduced or replaced the blue with green light. Um, we then had three treatments that partially or completely replaced the blue with far red light. And then three other treatments, one of which the blue was partially replaced by green or far red. And then we had a warm white treatment where plants were grown under just warm white LEDs, as well as a treatment in which plants were grown under a mint white or MW treatment. And this is basically a, as the name implies, a mintish white color. So it has a lot of green um, in the spectrum, as well as a little bit of far red but both the mint white and the warm white have relatively low intensities of blue. But what was kept the same in all of these treatments is the total photosynthetic, excuse me, the total photon flux density, which was kept at 180 micromoles. So that includes not only photosynthetic uh, radiation, but then the far red wave band. So um, William uh, did this study and he took some videos of plants growing under these four rather extreme uh, treatments. And so um, from there, we go to the video and you can see actually within the first day or two, some pretty remarkable differences in the morphology of the plant as it's grown under these different treatments. And so three of these have a high intensity of red and it's just whether the rest of the photon flux comes from blue, green, or far red light. 
and then how that compares with warm white, which is on the bottom right. So pretty pronounced changes. Um, and also fairly early, you can see uh, effects on the coloration of the leaves. So they might be a lighter green under the red and far red combination and a much darker green, or in some cases purple, if it's a red variety, under the red and blue treatment. These are representative plants where you can see the coloration differences pretty uh, remarkably, as well as the influence of the spectrum on the uh, leaf elongation. So um, you can see that basically the plants are most compact when under the red and blue spectrum. As you replace some of that blue with green, you see greater leaf elongation, but also a decrease in the coloration. Uh, somewhat similar effects when you replace some of the blue with far red. And then you can see the three treatments at the bottom that are um, not too dissimilar from the red and blue treatment, although probably the warm white and the mint white plants aren't quite as dark red as the uh, red and blue treatment. Then some representative plants of uh, the green leaf variety Rex. Um, probably what was most noticeable was just the effects on the leaf shape, where the leaves were a little rounder, um, broader, and not as elongated. Um, in treatments with a lot of blue or sometimes with green light compared to uh, treatments that included far red. So a pretty remarkable effect of far red on elongation of these lettuces. Now let's look at the data. And in this study and in the next one, uh, we plotted the data as a function of the intensity of blue light. So the blue photosynthetic, excuse me, the blue photon flux density in micromoles. So we have uh, treatments that included no blue light, which would be zero in this case, all the way to treatments where there was either no green or no far red, and that would be 60 micromoles of blue light in this case. So uh, first we're looking at leaf length of uh, Rex uh, lettuce, as well as leaf area of Siberian kale. And uh, we have the green lines, as well as the reddish lines, which represent uh, treatments in which uh, the green was substituted with blue or vice versa, um, as well as far red uh, substitutions. So for both of these lettuces, we see a pretty clear trend where as you increase the blue photon flux density, and at the same time you're decreasing green or far red, you see a decrease in the length or the leaf area for both of these. Looking at shoot fresh mass of both of these varieties, um, similar trends as we saw before, that as you increase the blue photon flux density, you're getting a decrease in the fresh mass. And um, that is especially the case when you are uh, replacing some of the red with green light. So we had our highest yields under uh, red and green light. And then as we introduced blue to that spectrum, you see the corresponding decrease. Okay, so that uh, generated some really interesting information, but we then wanted to know whether the changes that we observed in the effects of blue light were different, were caused by um, the increase in green light that we observed in the treatments, or if it was from the decrease in blue light. And so because blue and green intensities were changing at the same time, we couldn't uh, attribute responses to one or the other. And so we designed an experiment uh, in which we had different percentages of uh, blue, green, and red. So we started with four treatments where in one treatment we had only red, so 180 micromoles of that. And then we introduced or replaced some of that with pretty high intensities of blue ranging from 20 up to 100, 100 micromoles. There were then three, excuse me, four additional treatments where um, the red was partially substituted with green. So we had 60 micromoles of green. And then the re remaining um, red was then partly replaced by blue light. So basically we have treatments where there's either green light or there's not at each intensity of blue light. And again, plotted similarly to how we observed before, um, where we have the black line is when we did not include um, green in the spectrum, 
and the green line is when that red light was partly replaced with green light. And uh, looking at shoot fresh mass uh, or dry mass, and this, this is the cultivar Ushi, um, we see that a very good trend as we saw before, that as we increase the blue photon flux density, whether there's green light in the spectrum or not, we see a uh, decrease in the shoot fresh mass or the shoot dry mass. Um, there wasn't much of an effect on whether there was green in the spectrum, but a pretty clear trend that as we increased blue, we saw the leaves were shorter. And in the case of leaf width, there were fairly similar responses with or without green. And again, we saw also uh, slightly narrower um, leaves under higher intensities of blue light. Um, I, I didn't mention before, but we also had a warm white treatment uh, as well as uh, greenhouse control in which um, we, to the best of our ability, grew plants under similar uh, photo periods, daylight integrals, and um, temperature. There were some other differences that I won't get into, but uh, the data fit quite well considering um, the percentages of uh, blue, green, and red, uh, as well as far red that are in the greenhouse. Um, anyway, so the, the responses uh, fit some of the trends um, that we saw when the lettuces were grown indoors. So these are representative plants under the different treatments. Um, Basically, as you go from left to right, you are increasing the percentage of blue light. And as you do that, you can see leaf inhibition uh, increases, which also, um, but at the same time, the intensity of the coloration increases. And that if we look at within a blue light treatment or a blue light photon flux density, uh, whether it's 0, 20, 60, or 100, we see remarkably similar plants, and it suggests that responses that we see can be attributed mostly, or if not exclusively to changes in the blue photon flux, uh, and not the changes in the green photon flux. Okay, um, getting into some more recent uh, uh, experiments that we're doing. Um, this is something that Nathan uh, Kelly has been involved in, looking a little bit more at the effects of UV and blue light. So we've learned a lot from the previous studies and shown quite clearly how it affects or suppresses extension growth, which can also then lead to a, a decrease in the yield of the crop. Uh, but we also know that UV and blue can regulate quality attributes, and we've seen that in terms of coloration. But it cannot regulate other things such as the nutrient density, and also perhaps have effects on the tastes of, of how these leafy greens um, are. Um, so there are different secondary metabolites that are in plants. These are basically compounds that um, vary considerably from one cultivar or one species to another, but they, are, uh, they have different um, properties in plants and can elicit different colors, different tastes, uh, and different nutrition concentrations. So one of them, uh, group, one of the groups of secondary metabolites are phenolics, and they um, have antioxidant capacities and can impart these, some of these different flavors and colors. And then anthocyanins, which is a type of the one of the phenolic compounds, and that's primarily responsible for influencing the purple leaf coloration that we see in the red leaf varieties. And so uh, UV and blue can not only influence yield, but uh, the concentrations of some of these compounds. So we did a study, um, and there have been other studies before, looking at end of production lighting, uh, studies that have been done in greenhouses and indoors. Uh, but we wanted to generate our own data, looking at if we can supplement the spectrum with UVA and or blue light at the end of production, uh, whether we can get that increase in coloration without having a negative impact. Um, probably a more important reason to do this next study was to compare uh, plant responses under UVA, uh, ultraviolet A, relative to blue light, um, if one is better than another at influencing the production of some of these secondary metabolites. So we studied the Hushi variety, the red leaf variety, all plants grown under a 20 hour day, air temperature of 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and a total photon flux density of 180 micromoles. Similar to um, a couple studies ago, we primarily, uh, well, 
the plants were grown under 55% um, red LEDs and 45% warm white LEDs, which combines to relatively low blue photon flux density. So they were grown under those treatments. Uh, and then uh, for six days, we delivered end of production lighting, delivered either by UVA LEDs alone. Um, and the peak of that LED type is 385 nanometers and or blue LEDs with a peak of about 450 nanometers. And then we had two controls where in one case they did not receive uh, light beyond the 180 micromoles from the red and warm white, or they were given red and green light so that the total photon flux density was the same, but the spectrum was not enriched with UVA or S blue. So these are some of the preliminary results that we have not yet published, but um, again, 24 days under warm white and red light, and then six days of these six different treatments. So on the far left, we did not give any additional light, or we delivered 30 micromoles of UVA or blue light, or 30 micromoles of UVA and blue, 60 micromoles of blue, and then what we consider to be a control treatment with additional green and red light. So you can see uh, some pretty pronounced effects uh, on the coloration of the leaves. And um, we can quantify that um, by measuring uh, the, the leaf color. And so that's represented here by the CIE lab color space A value. And that is basically uh, indicating the, the degree of how red the, how red the leaf is. So the more positive the value, that means more red leaf. And as the photos indicate and the data support, the leaves are redder. Um, and statistically, so under the uh, 60 micromoles of UVA in blue or 60 micromoles of blue alone. So um, Nathan Kelly quantified some of the uh, secondary metabolites. Um, in red are the anthocyanins, and then in green are the total phenolics. And uh, we can see that in both cases, the delivery of um, blue and or UV and in actually one case, um, well, so delivery of, of UV, A, and or blue uh, increase the concentrations of both. And so even just six days of this additional lighting at the end of production, um, not only increase the leaf color, but then the compounds that are uh, responsible for that, as well as other compounds that, uh, as I said earlier, can impart effects on the taste of the different lettuces. Okay, um, so now I want to just give some um, also preliminary results from my colleagues, uh, Roberto Lopez in horticulture and his graduate student, Sean Tarr. And they have been looking at interactions of light with other environmental parameters, namely temperature and carbon dioxide. And so I'm happy that they have shared uh, some of their slides for me to share. So in this first study, they wanted to learn more about uh, the interaction of light intensity with temperature. And so they delivered a photosynthetic photon flux density of either 150 or 300 micromoles. And that was delivered for 17 hours per day to yield DLIs that were either about nine or 18 moles per day. Uh, these were also then grown under three different temperatures with a, a pretty large fluctuation in the day-night. So day-night uh, temperature fluctuation of about 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But you can see the average daily temperatures range from 68 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. In this case, they controlled the carbon dioxide concentration to 500 parts per million, um, a moderate uh, humidity at 60%, and they grew plants longer than in most of our studies, um, harvesting them either 35 or 36 days after seed sow. So this is um, the response for the cultivar Rex in terms of the leaf number. So not surprisingly, um, temperature is the primary factor that drives the development rate. And so we are still um, at or below the optimum temperature for lettuce. And so you see a corresponding increase in leaf number as the plants are growing progressively warmer. Now looking at fresh mass at these three different average daily temperatures, um, not surprisingly, you have more leaves and that resulted in greater fresh mass per head, relatively large lettuces um, 
with biomass increasing from about 115 uh, grams at 68 Fahrenheit and increasing to um, about 145 to 150 grams when you increase the temperature by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Looking only at, so that's basically looking at temperature um, under the two different light levels and then looking at PPFD or the, the light intensity, but combining the temperature data, you can see that um, plants were grown under the higher intensity had um, maybe 20 to 30% more biomass than under the lower intensity. So that's the data for Rex. Um, it's a little more complicated for Hushi, where increasing the temperature and the PPFD together increased growth more than either input uh, independently. And so they have some data that I'm sure they will be sharing um, that shows basically the interactions between these two. And they observed the highest yield when plants are grown both at the warmest temperatures and the highest light level. Um, they did note, however, that uh, they observed some tip burn, and uh, sometimes we see that when we grow lettuces under uh, quite high light intensities. Um, in this case, they grew at 150 or 300 micromoles per square meter in second, and their tip burn incidence for Rex increased from 18% up to 45% with that increase in PPFD. In Rushi, they didn't observe tip born at the lower intensity, but it increased up to 25% under the higher intensity. Um, I understand that obviously there's an impact on uh, light intensity, uh, but the fact that they observed a little bit of uh, tip burn at the lower PPFD suggests that maybe airflow or some other parameter um, was not uh, optimized and, and that might have contributed somewhat to this response. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, briefly a study that they've done looking at the effects um, of uh, temperature um, as well as carbon dioxide concentration. So here they kept the PPFD constant in all treatments of 300 micromoles. So uh, I would say this is pushing the limits for lettuce. Uh, however, the photo period was rather short at 17 hours per day, but still a, a light integral of 18 moles, which is uh, as I said before, pushing the limits. Um, they grew plants at three different carbon dioxide concentrations from 500 to 1,200 parts per million, and then used the same day-night temperature fluctuations and average daily temperatures as in the previous study. And um, almost as long of a uh, grow period, so plants were harvested 35 or 36 days after seed sow. So what did they observe? Well, I found this to be quite interesting. Um, there is some good data already that shows the effects of CO2 enrichment, especially under higher light levels and how it can increase the biomass of plants, including of lettuce. Um, but you can see here nicely, I think with Rex, that uh, there's a pretty uh, large jump in biomass as you increased from 500 to 800 parts per million. Uh, but then increasing beyond that had a relatively small impact on uh, further uh, increasing the, the fresh mass. And in the cultivar Hushi, um, it looked like there was uh, some sort of optimum CO2, somewhere between maybe 800 and 1,000 parts, and that actually, in this case, um, elevated CO2 at 1,200, um, slightly uh, suppressed the, the fresh mass. And so... Um, this fits well with other data and what growers are doing where they seem to be enriching CO2 somewhere around 700, 800 up to maybe 1,000 parts per million. In Rex, they did observe tip burn in all plants. Again, this is with 300 micromoles, um, whereas in Hushi, it was a little more variable and generally lower at the lower temperatures. So um, to conclude, I've gone through several different studies, um, kind of giving you the take home messages of the different study. Uh, so the yield and the quality of uh, characteristics of leafy greens increase with data light integral for lettuce at least until about 16 or 17 moles per day. Uh, beyond that, uh, the incidence or possibility of tip burn increases. Uh, we know um, quite clearly that blue light inhibits extension growth, which can translate into a, a decrease in yield. 
but it's important for driving many of the different quality parameters, such as the coloration, uh, as well as the nutrient density and production of different secondary metabolites. And partly because of this, I think there are opportunities for phasic lighting, and that's something we've done a little bit of uh, and continue to look at where you're changing the light spectrum during the production cycle. So as an example, the end of production lighting with blue or UV showed that, yes, we can get a relatively large plant and then get some of the quality attributes we're looking for by enriching the spectrum with uh, blue light. And then finally, just some preliminary information from my colleague that showed how increasing temperature and carbon dioxide concentration can increase growth, but there are some different optima and those different optima likely depend on certainly the species, but also the cultivar. So with that, um, I'm uh, ending my presentation, finishing uh, maybe even a little bit early, which is unusual, um, but that should hopefully mean that we have time for questions, answers, and discussion. Thanks, Eric. Uh, great presentation, a lot to cover here. I have some questions on the chat. I don't know why my camera is not working. I saw your message at the beginning. I thought my camera was operating. Uh, can you guys see, can you see me, Eric? Yeah, I can see you now. Yep. Because, you know, it's not showing up on my screen here. Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, great. So Eric, thank you so much. You have some good questions. I can kick off some of those questions. Uh, there, I can see me now. Uh, okay. You, you come up with three very nice uh, different studies. Uh, I know you're doing most of the things on the cell lab, which is indoor egg. So uh, one of the questions kind of related to the greenhouses, but the other I think is very general. So my, my first comment here on the first presentation, you show the data on the effects of delivering the same DLI uh, over different photo periods, right? If I have the same DLI over the same uh, different photo periods, higher or lower intensities, the data shows that lower intensity, higher photo period, better benefits, especially the high DLIs when you're to the right of the graph. Correct. Are you seeing growers implementing that? Because I, I think I've seen that from you other times before. I've, I've seen this, this information is very consistent. Are, mm -hmm. are growers implementing that? You see people implementing that? And what are the limitations if they're not doing that? What are the limitations? It's morphology on the plants. Uh, and again, if it's an indoor farm, you have better control than in a greenhouse. But what is your view from the industry and what can we, what is the push for growers to adopt those findings? That's a great question. And I'm not sure I can shed much light on it um, other than, did you get that one? Um, <laughs> other than, you know, if you think about the cost to install uh, light, as you increase the PPFD, it's gonna get progressively more expensive. So if we were to look at the economics purely from a hardware perspective, it would be cheaper to deliver for a long, you know, light for a long period of time at a lower intensity than, than the opposite. Um, what growers are doing or not, you know, I know there's some reluctance to um, deliver light continuously, 24 hours. We've done it in several studies and have not noted any negative effects. I have heard um, anecdotally that some people have reported that there may be some sacrifices to the shelf life. So we have not specifically tested that and it, it certainly is a possibility. Um, so I think there is an opportunity. I, to be honest, I don't know of any compelling data that shows that there is a negative effect of lighting lettuce um, continuously, but I'm also keeping an open mind until I see data. Right, and that's an important point, right? That's for lettuce, for leafy greens or in, in, in lettuce. You're not right. extrapolating for other ones. Yeah, I think right. one thing, one limitation sometimes is just lighting pollution in a greenhouse or sure. the neighbors. So there's, I know that's a hard one, uh, but if you're going, and then I don't know how low is acceptable. If you're talking about really low light intensities, if there is a threshold that is acceptable by the neighbors that is not bothering them, but then I don't know if that's significant for the crop or not, but anyway. Yeah, um, you know, so we have done a lot of work with a, a variety of floriculture crops grown under different photo periods, including up to continuous light. And vast majority of plants tolerate it fine, um, but there are uh, examples here and there, and of course tomato is a, a great one where there are negative consequences of continuous lighting. Um, and so we've seen that, sometimes you see an increase in leaf area with photo period, and so that may be playing a, a a small role into some of what we saw. And in fact, 
um, I should look a little closer at the data, but the, at least in some cases, it looked like there might have been some um, plateaus of some of the different parameters we measured under, uh, you know, mole, uh, daylight integral of 12, 13, 14 moles. And then as we got beyond that, we started to see like a inflection point. Um, and so anyway, the, the, most plants tolerate continuous light fine, but there are uh, plants, especially in the um, Solanaceae or the nightshade family that do show some undesirable responses to continuous light. Right, great, thanks. Uh, I think another one that was very interesting, I'm jumping to the last study now, uh, you talk about temperature and, and light control, and when you control them together, have better effects than one or the other. Uh, here, my question is, if understood right, temperature is the, is the driving force. That was what presented, and then you can, right, has bigger effect than lighting. So if that's the case, uh, are growers doing those chains? I know, especially in a greenhouse, again, where you have better, higher fluctuations, they're trying to maintain temperature. But if you think about Michigan, uh, to warm up the greenhouse in the winter or then cool down uh, during the summer, if your temperature is slight high or is slight lower in different times of the year, I have not seen yet growers changing their target DLIs to match this fluctuation and try to optimize by saving energy if the temperature is not high enough and you just try wasting energy, the plants are not growing, or doing the opposite, bumping up the light because you have better temperature and, and it's speeding up biomass or something, uh, any other uh, requirements they have quality in their crops. Have you seen people doing that? And again, if not, what is the push that we need to take those technologies to market again, those findings? Yeah, um, so there are lots of elements to your comments and then question. Um, so, so getting back to the first thing, um, so that was that was research done by Shantar and Roberto Lopez, and so I don't I don't know their data as well as they do, so I want to be careful in interpreting it. But temperature is the primary factor of leaf development rate, but generally light still has the biggest impact on total biomass. So there are going to be interactions between temperature and light. Um, so anyway, I don't want to get into specifics, but I don't think the take-home message is that you should necessarily grow at a really warm temperature because we only talked about biomass. We didn't really talk about um, quality attributes. And what often happens with a lot of crops, um, especially when you're getting into these uh, higher 70 degree temperatures, is that the quality begins to decrease. And so then you begin to have some of these trade-offs between yield and quality. And so uh, anyway, just want to urge caution that someone doesn't just go out and raise their greenhouse or indoor farm temperature by 10 degrees because there, there certainly will be some trade-offs. Um, so now let's see, what was your... <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you got a lot of debate, which is great. That is yeah. a great point to clarify before, but my question was really on... Our growers... Changing, yeah, changing the, the DLI or the lighting control to follow yeah. temperature within, considering those limits that it just yeah. said, very important. Well, um, that's great. Uh, so I know that there's been a lot of work in, um, uh, in Denmark that has looked at uh, temperature and light integration. And instead of controlling for rigid set points each day, that they would, they would increase the, um, the set points so that they're not cooling uh, on a warm day as much or venting on a cold day as much. So having increased tolerances where maybe on a, every week they have a, they do achieve their target light integrals or their target uh, temperatures, but it's a little more, um, I don't know what the word would be, elastic uh, uh, control of how they deliver that. And what's happened is that they have seen some um, consistent decreases in, in energy consumption for the lights and for the uh, heating. So of course, Denmark doesn't get as cold as it can in, in the Northern US as well as in Canada, um, but it's still you know, a, a low light environment. And so I do think that there are opportunities to do what you described. Um, I'm not aware of greenhouse situations that do that, although I think there is some of that going on. Um, I just can't point you in any specific direction. Great, great. Yeah, but that's great to hear because we see you and Roberto and you know, all these studies are so much technology and knowledge coming over. How can it get, make sure it's been applied uh, because the data is 
it's clear sometimes. So uh, I think another, some good questions. Now we have more specific questions uh, to, to this study. So one of them is asking, uh, as temperature or light intensity rises, I think is in regarding to the T-burn study, yeah. Are there recommendations for airflow for minimizing tick burn? So you mentioned the effects of those. Are they a set of recommendations to avoid that scenario? Yeah, so uh, first uh, colleagues at Arizona, so Marat Casera and Cherry Kubota at um, Ohio State are doing a lot of work looking at um, understanding tick burn and measures to uh, reduce or decrease or, or mitigate um, tick burn. It's challenging because there's so many different factors that can influence it, but certainly airflow or not enough airflow um, is a leading contributor to that as well as high light intensity. So um, we recommend when possible, uh, an airflow rate of at least about 0 0.5 meters per second. Um, that it's very hard to get uniform airflow in an indoor farm. Uh, and that's something that Maraca Sarah is studying it's a little bit easier in a greenhouse where you have much larger areas with fewer obstacles. But because of the nature of, of um, indoor farms and often how the ventilation is set up, uh, it's very difficult to get a uniform airflow. But basically you wanna try to avoid the extremes. So as long as you have some airflow, is the minimum 0 0.3, is it 0 0.5? You wanna make sure that you have some airflow everywhere um, if you're in a hydroponic system, you can probably tolerate quite a bit higher velocities, um, but the more variable it is in terms of airflow, if you're growing in a substrate like peat or, um, or the like, then it's difficult to manage from a watering perspective. So uh, kind of a long answer that there are some minimums and at least some airflow is very important. Great, and I think related to that, Eric, uh, I, now I can remember when this question came, so I don't know if it was regard to one of these specific studies, but it's a good general way is if uh, you measure or what was the relative humidity used on those experiments? In the first studies that we have done, we have not um, controlled it other than um, making sure that it's not excessively dry. Um, so, you know, humidities would be fluctuating depending upon the season in which we did the experiment, but generally it's going to be very low in our first study. Um, in the latter two studies that were done by my colleagues, um, they controlled it at, I believe it was 60%. Um, in hindsight, because they were different temperatures, they probably should have controlled by VPD. And I know in future studies, they will be um, controlling so that the VPD is the same at the different temperatures. Great. Yeah. Uh, another question, more technical specific, is there an increase in biomass yield by raising the percentage of far red light from 2 to 3% uh, to 8 to 9%? Did you see any effects there? Um, so yeah, you will see a, bi a biomass increase as you add far red, assuming that your PPFD is the same. So if it's basically you're adding on and your total photon flux density is not constant. Um, you typically will see an increase. And so, uh, you know, Mark Van Ersel, um, Bruce Bugby, and uh, Xu Yen Zong have been doing a lot of work with FARAD as well as uh, people in my group. And um, you do see an increase in biomass. And I think part of that is because of an increase in, long, in elongation. Um, and then maybe secondarily, because some of those photons are capable at, of driving photosynthesis and increasing growth directly. So yeah, there, there is some value um, to including far red in a, in a spectrum, especially, okay. if it's, especially if it's free, if it's already there, uh, as opposed to it's not. Yeah, and that, that's a good segue. That was my one of my last questions. So I had one for each one of the experiments you did, uh, goes to the spectrum. Uh, but then again, you did the experiments on the cell, which is totally, uh, right, you're using the LEDs, you're controlling uh, the lighting conditions from source source lighting. So I think my question will be more to the greenhouse environment where uh, you demonstrate the effects on growth uh, of all these different uh, spectrum combinations. So my question to you becomes, how do you balance uh, or how you bring those findings to a greenhouse in which you have the sun, which is a strong buffer, right? The, the effects of spectrum control. So uh, you're not gonna be able to adjust those ratios throughout the day because of the sun. You can do at the end of the day. So that's one part of the question. And then attached to this question is, 
how you go on the trade-off. So let's say you find the best spectrum that works for you, but now to get to that spectrum, you have to use less powerful LEDs. You might need some green LEDs or blue LEDs. So you're sacrificing power, right? The efficacy, the micromoles per due in order to get the right spectrum. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, we could talk about that for a long time. Um, <laughs> and it's one of these questions, I don't think there's a definitive answer. Um, they're just different talking points. And so, um, you know, generally the effects of the spectrum are greater under lower solar light conditions, right? Um, and so when we've done work, this is going back to some work um, that, that Brian Poole did when he was a master's student at Michigan State where um, we deliver different spectra during the winter on different um, greenhouse crops. And there was relatively little effect on the, the growth or the flowering of those crops. But this is when um, we were giving, a, there was already at least seven or eight moles of, of light from the sun. Roberto Lopez and some of his students did similar studies, but under lower solar light conditions. And that's where we saw the spectrum had a more powerful impact. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to decide, uh, you know, are you, you're probably going to be lighting the most when sunlight is the lowest, right? And so you probably want to pick that as a default, knowing that that'll, the spectrum will have the biggest impact at that time. And then as the solar light levels increase, the spectral effects will begin to wash off. Um, I think, you know, efficacy is a big driving force and, you know, red LEDs are still the most efficacious. Um, including some blue, which are also fairly efficient, or using a lot of white LEDs. I think both are, are, are viable alternatives. Um, it probably gets down into the nuances of the economics and the efficiency of the, of the fixtures. And so it's hard to get too de detailed until you start getting into, into those details. Right. Uh, part, yeah, that, that makes sense, Eric. Uh, do you have time for maybe one or two more questions? I don't know. Sure. So yeah, there is one that is very interesting. Uh, it's talking about now in indoor farm, uh, is that common in commercial indoor farms for growers to use the same night and day temperature fluctuations that you would see in a greenhouse? Are they replicating that with the same period and the same set points? And is there benefits for that? Usually fairly similar. Um, I think a lot of it will also depend on um, you know, where the, the greenhouse is located geographically. Um, so there might be a tendency to grow a little bit cooler in the winter in northern regions uh, because of the cost of, of uh, natural gas and things. But having said that, you know, they strive to maintain similar quality uh, month to month. And so they don't deviate, I don't think, too much from, you know, to the best of their ability from a, a greenhouse control perspective uh, to deviate too much seasonally. Um, Having said that, you know, usually I, I'm not aware, and I'm sure there's some that exist where there's a grower that's producing the same crops, both in greenhouses and indoor farms. It's usually one or the other. And I think they begin to look at environmental optimization considering their facility. Um, you know, one of the big benefits of an indoor farm is you can pretty much control everything as long as it's properly engineered. Whereas a greenhouse, you can only modify uh, you know, the environment, you can't completely control it. So looking at the trade-offs and, you know, what, what are the capabilities of each structure? Um, how much sunlight do you receive at the greenhouse? Uh, how much is electricity? All these different factors can play roles in, in your environmental set points. Perfect. Uh, so I think the last question I'll, I'll mix together because there are several questions regarding to that. Uh, and my apply to all the experiments you said was about the quality. So some people asking if you measure bricks, uh, some people asking about the impacts of the different treatments on shelf life and quality. Uh, so there, there might be four or five different questions about specific things. Let's wrap okay. all together and talk about the effects on the quality and, and shelf life. Yeah, there are so many quality parameters. Um, we have measured some of them, but certainly not all of them. Um, there is some, People, you know, looking at our Optimia group, um, there is a lot of consistency in what we measure, but in some cases, some researchers are, are measuring other things. So the most common things we measure, of course, are leaf color. Um, sometimes it's uh, LAB color, colorimeter measurement to measure the greenness or the purpleness 
uh, sometimes it's the chlorophyll concentration. Um, we can, uh, very few studies that we have done have looked at post-harvest. We did do one study, um, a visiting scholar um, uh, was here and, and she did some work looking at uh, different spectral effects on growth, but then whether that translated over to post-harvest. And there were a few differences in quality. Um, I would have to look closer at that data because it's been a while. So I, I better be careful what I say, but there were some spectral effects in terms of post-harvest. Um, what else have we measured? Oh, we're getting more into, uh, Nathan Kelly is getting more into measurement of some of the different secondary metabolites. Uh, those, those take a lot of time to, to do, uh, a lot of lab equipment. And so they're not trivial to measure, but um, we know those are important because they can influence things like the nutritional content or the intensity of the flavor. And so we can, we, we've also done some consumer preferencing uh, work that was actually part of the study. I just didn't include it um, in, this, in this talk, but we looked at growing lettuces under different spectra and whether um, people could perceive differences in their taste or their preference. Um, the take home message of that very briefly was there, there are few or no differences in lettuces that are grown indoors under pretty different spectra. Um, but what people noticed the difference in was the lettuce grown in the greenhouse. And generally the lettuce in the greenhouse was more bitter and had a little bit lower preference rate than the lettuces grown indoors. Um, so there, there could be lots of reasons for that. You know, we tried to control some of the environmental parameters the best we could, but there are other things that we can't, we can't, our take home message is not that lettuce grown indoors tastes better than in a greenhouse. It's just that there were some detectable differences and uh, it is something we want to get into more in the future. Sure. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. I think if you want to make a, just a quick plug in here, because I know you and your team are doing a huge amount of work for Optimia and include some of that, the consumer preferences and economics. If you want to share with the people where they can find more information about that, I think it would be great because that people asking those questions would be interesting learning more about this project. Sure. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and throw that last, one of my slides up. Um, sure. Which, you can, you can uh, share your screen. Yeah. And if you want to put something in the chat box or anything like that, yeah. Okay. I can do that as well. I don't know uh, what is the right link to share. Yeah. Um, it's SCRI Optimia. So, sorry, I'm. Have to thumb up. And I have the link here. I'll put on the chat box. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, there's the. Uh, the URL at the top. So there will be, uh, you know, we have a fair amount of information. Um, what I showed the last uh, kind of quick experiments I walked through was all preliminary. So that's not been published yet, but there's certainly some things that we have done that we, that I didn't include in this talk. So uh, this is a good resource and please check back because I and my colleagues will be adding to this uh, website as we generate more information and, and get it published. Great, yeah, so I hope, and I'm sure people will. Uh, lots of those questions are getting here. They can find plenty of resources there. Uh, that's excellent. Well, Eric, thank you so much uh, for participating this year again on our Glaze webinar series. I hope we can do this again next year. Uh, every time we get a huge attendance here, great questions, great discussion. So we look forward to get an updated presentation next year, hopefully. Okay, here I come. Uh, any closing considerations with the audience? Uh, um, no, you know, I just, I just tried to, you know, I want my choice or preference, I guess, was to cover a lot of different topics. But knowing that we, there wasn't time in, to go into too much detail, of course, the detail is probably uh, where it really matters when it gets into implementation. Um, so some of this has that. You know, we've published scientific articles if people wanted to get into the data a little bit more to understand things. Um, but we are also publishing these in um, trade magazine articles. In fact, we have a series uh, right now that we're in the midst of in, I um, uh, <laughs> can't think of the magazine offhand, but anyway, <laughs> that information will be added to the, the Optimia website as they're published. Excellent. Yeah. So again, encourage everyone to go and visit the website. So SCRI-Optimia.org. Uh, Eric, 
thanks again. I hope we have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining and sticking yep. with us all the way to the end. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.